So in this simulation experience that people engage in, the harder individuals work to improve the performance of their own department, the worse the system as a whole per performs. You know, you just have to flip a sense of loss to a sense of gratitude <laughs> and that work. But I did wish at the time there was something like a, a support group for retiring pilots <laughs> that I could be with. And I, I did talk to some people who had retired retired pilots I knew and so forth, but it it's a hard thing to give up. You can't go back to school um, to study something of interest, can't this, can't that. But my gosh, you know, had a very fulfilling life. And so you make the most of what the hand you're dealt and of what you've got. Her ties family. And so that is maybe the only similarity I can think of, which is make the lear learning experience positive make it memorable so it sticks and you know make sure people feel satis the fat satisfaction the reward of then executing better performance in their work every day as a result I guess the impact is simply wow this is completely changing this young woman's life good for her how brave to leave everything behind and move to an entirely, you know, across two states um, to start a new life. I've never had a dog before, but it just sounds felt like the right time to do this. In fact, this dog is so sweet, such a nice temperament that we've had her certified as a therapy dog. And I do I volunteer at places to do pet therapy people in hospitals and so forth with her. It's a lot of fun. That's new in my life. Bet is the founder and senior educator at Breakthrough Learning, a company that she founded more than 40 years ago to help organizations and teams learn how to improve together by using a tool kind of like a flight simulator for organizations. But more than that, Bet is an experienced pilot, a compassionate volunteer and board member for Angel Flight West. And for me, an incredible cache of wisdom, experience, and knowledge. You are going to love the conversation that we get to have with Bet Gardner today. Bet, you're in a transition period where yes. you're scaling back your professional commitments and dedicating more time to hobbies, family, friends, and what you describe as an active life. Can you tell me how you arrived at the decision to enter this transition and how is that going for you? Um, wow, sure. I am in a transition, although I must say, I think I feel like I've been in a transition my whole adult life, one thing or another. So <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's not such an unusual state for me. But yes, I... Um, kind of made the decision to start dialing down my work hours, actually starting some time ago, you know, maybe 10 years ago, and um, hired my replacement and ultimately turned over the company to him. Now I'm working for him and able to let go of lots of the things that had become, you know, a bit tiresome, the administrative aspects of running a business and um, what I retained is the opportunity to work with clients, which I love, and work on product development, which I love, and, you know, we work well in that. So it's that kind of time of life related. I've entered my 70s, and I'm very aware of, you know, the horizon I have ahead and the fact that you know, I want to spend my time in the way I want to spend my time. <laughs> um, it's precious. And this is the time of life. And this is perhaps maybe the best decade in which to have the freedom to do things that I want. And um, 
so I've, I've made a lot of changes just in the last uh, couple of years um, in this decade of my life. Um, I moved from my home of 35 years in the San Francisco Bay Area to Portland, Oregon. Um, wow. My husband and I moved here. Um, so new community, new everything, um, urban environment instead of suburban. And that move was prompted by several things, but it was a time of life thing. It's where one of my sons live and he's the one of the three sons who are most stable in location <laughs> probably not going to move around a lot and you know at this point in life it feels like you should be in your family you know they all moved away the parents kind of have to move toward the children at some point <laughs> instead of vice versa if you want to have them in your life and be very involved and have support in your later years so moving to portland um we, um, during the pandemic, um, which was, um, you know, a good time to move in a way because I was hunkered down for about a year unpacking boxes and so <laughs> forth. Um, but we, we got a dog, we got a puppy and that's new in my life. Never had a dog before, <laughs> but it just sounds, felt like the right time to do this. Um, in fact, this dog is so sweet, such a nice temperament that we've had her certified as a therapy dog. And I do I volunteer at places to do pet therapy, people in hospitals and so forth with her. It, yeah, a lot of fun. That's new in my life. Um, I ended my flying career and that was a kind of tough decision. And, uh, but it was the right decision at the right time. I can tell you why I did that. And so at the same time as I'm kind of dialing down those things, I was able to kind of step up some things that I wanted to spend time on and, you know, more closer, richer relationships with friends, family. Um, yeah, you mentioned, did you mention pottery? I have a hobby that I've developed. I've been able to spend a lot more time on, which I love and that's fun. So not sure I answered your question, but yeah, I've been changing, have, making a lot of changes and it's invigorating um, at this point in life to have a new chapter or two or three. Um, so I recommend it highly. <laughs> I love that you said it was invigorating because for some people transition can be terrifying, but it seems like you've <laughs> yeah. embraced a lot of different transitions with enthusiasm. And I have, you left me a lot of little breadcrumbs there, Beth, that I'm oh. very interested to follow up on. My dog is snoring at my feet right Aww. now. And both of her parents were therapy dogs. Aww. And when we got her, that was part of our vision for her as well. And it turns out she's just really great therapy for my family. And so we've never gone further <laughs> than that. Um, I love but it. But that can be difficult. That puppy stage is sometimes maddening uh, getting through that. So w why did you feel like now was the time to get a dog and do that? And what have been some of the highs and lows in that experience? Well, um, first of all, to that issue of the puppy stage being challenging, um, it had its minor challenges, but I have a great method for getting a puppy. Um, what okay. it did we want to know <laughs> that lessened that immensely <laughs> what we did is um you know i had been kind of looking out for a puppy from a rescue place and i couldn't find the ones that checked the boxes of the criteria that i was really looking for um and so i did stumble upon a breeder who just had an excellent operation and they had a litter that was right. And they had a service that I just loved and took advantage of as an option when the puppy was eight weeks. Um, they will send the puppy to the home of a trainer. So living with a professional trainer 
and her family and two other dogs that were there and children and so forth. And so we didn't get the puppy till eight weeks later. We had her for literally eight weeks of her formative time with a trainer. So she came to us knowing all the basic commands, being completely socialized, not being bothered by, you know, vacuum cleaners and trucks and so forth, being crate trained, you know, walking on a leash beautifully. I mean, it was, you know, amazing. It's partly her temperament, but she had the training. So we just needed to continue that training and reinforce it and extend it a bit. But um, really, puppyhood is a lot easier when you skip the first <laughs> 16 weeks or so. So that's the method. No, there was has not been any down any hard things about it. It's, she's been very easy, which I'm grateful for because she's the first dog I've ever had. And, you know, I didn't really know what we we're going to be getting into, but it's been that good. We did something almost identical to that. Really? So I can add another voice for that approach. Yes. Now, the approach that our breeder took was, um, I can't remember at what week, but we were allowed to go over with the litter and began to get familiar. Mm. And she had a large litter of puppies. I don't remember how many, um, but she didn't let you choose your own dog. She would like, we had to do like a personality profile. This is you know, the same stuff thing. about our family. Was okay, this a so breeder we went through that a was just like outside of Toronto? It was in Canada? No, she's in, ours okay. was in Arizona, okay. but similar process. And Same then process. she said, okay, here's the puppy for you. Yep. And then, the, you know, Melly, our puppy, went uh, to the trainer. And then when we got her, same way. She, she okay. It was amazing, and it's been great. Um, okay, so now I have a really fun question. <laughs> you didn't train puppies, but you did training for organizations and leaders. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> what were some of the similarities in what you were trying to do with organizations? And this would be a good point maybe to provide some history of your professional experience and mm -hmm. how your training helped organizations have a great experience like what you're having with your puppy. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm reaching for what is similar. <laughs> <laughs> puppies are simple and um you know, training them is a very straightforward thing of you know, rewards, be positive, that sort of thing. So that is maybe the only similarity I can think of, <laughs> which is make the lear learning experience positive, um, make it memorable so it sticks, and, you know, make sure people feel satis the fat satisfaction, the reward of then executing better performance in their work every day as a result. So uh, that's maybe a stretch. That's <laughs> so that's, fan that's that fantastic. <laughs> Tell us about your professional experience. Um, well, there's a history going way back, but starting with this uh, company I founded in the 1980s, it's called Breakthrough Learning. And it, started as a consulting firm. Um, I had clients that I was working with and, um, you know, very satisfying work, just being able to be very client focused instead of formerly where I was an employee in a company, you know, having to kind of do all kinds of things that I didn't particularly choose to do or didn't feel like was a great use of my time. <laughs> Um, so anyway, I liked the consulting world of only being hired when you were valued <laughs> and only being called back when you added value and uh, instant feedback. That was really satisfying and not having to work for anyone you didn't want to work for, you know, being able to choose what kind of work to do and who to work with. So I started as a consulting company, um, after a prior corporate career of some sorts. And so, but it evolved over time. Um, in the consulting work, I found myself working with teams and starting to do a fair amount of teaching and training. And so I always felt that 
the consulting work with a team really is a learning experience for them. And that's what I wanted to fashion it as. So it's not just me coming in and saying, here are the 10 things you would, you know, you got to do. It's sort of saying, let's explore this complex, knotty problem that you're trying to deal with. And let's tease it apart. Let's share, you know, our understanding of it and get on the other side of it together and walk through a process with them to do that. Um, so as I was doing training and I started needing tools for doing it and I developed some of my own and anyway, long story short, I ended up morphing the company from a consulting firm to a product firm and Hmm. Now, Breakthrough Learning is focused on offering, developing and offering innovative tools for teams to learn and to perform better. Um, so that's the fun product development part that I'm engaged in. And we have things we offer to the public, but we also have uh, tools that we develop that are customized for individual clients who want a specialized tool for their own issues. What, uh, I know there's a Hallmark tool that you developed for hospitals. Can you tell us about that <laughs> as an example of the tools that you've developed? Sure. Um, it's sort of been a flagship product for many years. It's called Friday Night at the ER, and it is a team learning game. It's a simulation that people engage in that involves playing the role of a hospital manager as a team of four or more and managing a fictitious hospital over a simulated 24 hour period where the hours tick by and each hour the person playing the role of manager of a department, say the emergency room or surgery or critical care, uh, sees patients arriving, they have patients leaving, they have to apply resources to manage those patients. There are spikes in volume, there's various uneven workloads that people have, there's um, unexpected events that happen that they have to deal with. So it's a simulation experience of playing this role. Um, the simulation only takes about an hour to play the game. It's very engaging for people. And the lessons involve moving those people from silo thinking to systems thinking. You know, people tend to be very siloed in organizations, particularly large organizations. Um, usually the larger, the more siloed they are in that they are just focused on their problem. And in particular, when there's a lot of pressure of you know, problems arise or crises, what we find people most often do is focus back on just their area and do it harder, work harder, faster, get through the crisis that way. When actually, in most cases, what's actually needed is something quite different, which is collaborating across you know, functional boundaries, departmental boundaries, and so forth, reaching out and working collaboratively as a team to manage a crisis simultaneously and in a collaborative, coordinated way. Um, sort of sharing responsibility for the whole system, the overall organization's performance, not just doing their job. So in this simulation experience that people engage in, um, the harder individuals work to improve the performance of their own department, the worse the system as a whole per performs. And so players are keeping some records as they go through this of certain performance indicators about their department. And in the end, they realize, ah, 
too late, but I really scored poorly on managing quality and cost. And I think I needed to work in a different way. And then they get to play again. I mean, it's a practice field. <laughs> Simulations are great that way, as we know, as pilots. Um, you can crash the organization and play again and learn, you know, what works and try out new behaviors that you're being taught or, you know, learn, learn by doing. It's experiential learning. So it's a game, basically. We developed it as a tabletop game where you can have a room of, you know, 50 tables and 200 participants, or you can have a team of four in one room playing this game um, on the tabletop. And um, we also have a virtual version that we developed during the pandemic such that people can play remotely um, when that's the feasible way for them to do it. And teaches the same lessons and is designed in the same way. Um, the gameplay is about an hour. The debrief in which you take people through a structured uh, reflection piece. Um, they become kind of students of their own behavior. It's learningful. They have ahas. They want to play the game again and apply what they've learned. And it helps them um, think about and plan what are they going to do differently Monday morning. And mm -hmm. um, because it's an experiential activity that's fun, engaging, challenging, brings out everyone's kind of visceral side, not just the intellectual side, um, it's memorable. And, you know, people say, the lessons stick over time. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. But that's incredible. And <laughs> can you share a real world success story of an organization that applied what they learned or used Friday night at the ER, which by the way, to me sounds terrifying. It just sounds like as a parent, I have eight kids. Friday oh. night at the ER is a simulation that I feel like I've played over and over again. Oh. And I'm not getting any I'm not getting any better at it. But is there an organization maybe that's taken what they've learned from this simulation and applied it to achieve some magnificent results? Um sure. There first of all, the organizations that use this are not just hospital organizations, although mm. Hospitals love it because it's their subject. The hospital in the game is just a metaphor for any system in which a team has to perform better. Mm -hmm. Usually it involves some demand, some processing, some handoffs between departments and so forth. So it the, the lessons are universal. And the reason the hospital theme works so well is that everybody and across industries and cultures. They know what a hospital is. They've seen TV shows about hospitals. You don't need to know any hospital knowledge to play this game. So, okay. um, you know, we find major manufacturing companies playing this game and they finish the game. Like, ah, this is our company. Oh my gosh. You know, they, they, it feels very real, uh, even in other countries and so forth. Um, where things are quite different. Um, examples. Um, some of them are little examples, but they've made a big difference. Um, in rural South Carolina, these are hospitals that are sole providers and have um, a number of issues in um, managing with limited resources um, and you know, increasing demand. And um, they just have been playing the game, had been playing the game and came up in the debrief with the idea that maybe instead of, um, you know, pushing patients, pushing the system to accept patient transfers as needed, 
maybe they ought to pull patients. So they ended up with a new practice of intensive care nurses going to the ER when the hospital was busy and pulling patients to the ICU instead of waiting for the patient to sit there on a gurney in the emergency department for hours and hours until a transfer request was received, until the administrative paperwork was done, until blah, 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 and they freed up a bed. So it's just a, you know, it's one small thing. Another very large hospital in Texas um, instituted a practice of a 3 a.m. huddle every night um, where uh, all the night managers of the various departments um, started a process of, you know, a 20 minute huddle and literally deciding, okay, who's ready to exit in the morning? <laughs> Who can we transfer? You know, what do we have to put in place for that to happen? What, and, you know, there are a million things you have to put in place for a hospital to be, you know, discharge a patient, medications and transport and all kinds of things. Um, and they just made it happen. So they were able to trim the length of stay in the hospital um, by that practice alone and hugely impactful on their bottom line because as you may know, hospitals have to manage for efficient lengths of stay and it's very costly to go beyond you know, benchmarks and they go beyond benchmarks all the time. Um, so in the healthcare world, that's been a couple of little examples. I don't know, I don't want to go on and on that don't sound so transformational, but they made a difference. And moreover, they made these new practices that people have adopted specific to their particular situation, um, kind of open their minds to what can be done, that something can be done. We can do things differently. So I think there's a powerful ripple effect on behavior in general um, from some of these initiatives that are undertaken. I love that, Bet. And my dad, you know, one of the things that he said quite often, and it's what is on his headstone was to remember the little things because he believed that it was the little things that made the biggest difference. And so I, I see that in what you're saying, that there's little changes that people and organizations can make, but the result of that is amplified across, you know, it can be people, processes, whatever amplifies that to make a really big difference. Um, I didn't realize that you had started this company in the 80s and you know ha as an entrepreneur i understand some of the sacrifices that involves in creating and, and building a company and one of the things at the beginning of our interview that you said is that you were working to deepen relationships spend time with family do you feel like there was a sacrifice made there as you were growing the company and for me, I know that that has been true, that, you know, with the perspective that I have now, I would advise, you know, 22 year old entrepreneur, Alan, to do things a little bit different. So as you look back um, over your career, are there things where maybe you wish you'd had a simulator for your own entrepreneurial experience? And are there things that maybe you would do different? Um Sure. I felt at times that I was spread too thin. Um, mm. And, you know, building a career while growing a family, as I'm sure you know, you know, is a challenge just in terms of the time that you have, which is so finite. And how do you spread that around and how do you prioritize what, when? Um, I honestly don't know what I would have done differently because I had very little resources when I was starting out and, mm -hmm. 
you know, not the money to hire the nanny or the, you know, something that would have helped a lot. But, um, <laughs> you know, my wonderful husband, Michael, and I, you know, kind of worked it out. Um, he actually started a consulting practice himself and the kids were toddlers. And um, we just had a commitment to, to work home-based as much as possible to have the kids in some kind of daycare, but pretty minimal. And for one of us to always be home. So um, if I was traveling, he was not. If he was traveling, I was not. And so the kids had a little kind of schizophrenic parental relationships. <laughs> but I don't think that did them That's any harm. generally true for everyone. I know, I know. It's so funny, you know, I'd come home from being away for two days with a client or something. And that night, um, when a kid would invent, you know, wake up in the night with wanting a drink of water or a stomach ache or something, they'd call daddy, daddy, you know, coming in. because they had been used to that for the last two nights. And the absolute opposite would happen when he was away and I was in charge. Yeah, so we saw that happen, but um, that worked really well for having um at least feeling that we had the kind of stable family relationships and, you know, could give the kids the attention they deserved. But yeah, um, it was challenging. I didn't quite at the time see much any other way to do it. And um, it was a little bit exhausting. Um, yeah. We had, you know, when we traveled, we cut it as short as possible. I would end a engagement, you know, or I would start an engagement at seven in the morning somewhere. I had, you know, just end at night, you know, come back at two in the morning, be up the next morning with the kids. You know, it just was a little bit physically exhausting. But um, that's kind of how. I did it, how we did it together. Um, so for someone still in the thick of it, this could be me, this yeah. could be someone else oh, yeah. listening. What advice would you give? About managing career and family together? Is that yeah. what you're asking? Okay. Yeah. How to, I don't know that balance is really a great word because I think something is always out of balance. Um, but just looking back over the experience that you had, both business and family, mm -hmm. successes yeah. and failures, yeah. Um, what advice would you give? Well, to my mind, it's prioritize family for sure. Mm -hmm. No question about it. Accept that that will feel good and pay off in current time in terms of the kids behavior and how they're <laughs> evolving as well as in your future when you want to have those close relationships and keep them um, with rich family memories and so forth. Um, know that it takes sacrifice to do that. Um, and, you know, for me, I, was very aware of all the opportunities coming my way that I could not pursue or did not pursue. Mm -hmm. I was just, you know, can't do that. You know, can't work in sub-Saharan Africa for a month. You know, it just, there's just so many things I couldn't do. Um, can't go back to school, um, to study something of interest. Can't this, can't that, but, oh my gosh, you know, had a very fulfilling life. And so, you make the most of what you, the hand you're dealt and of what you've got and um, prioritize family. Um, the business is just not as important. Um, it ebbs and flows and over time it matters, but not anywhere nearly as much as your family relationships. Um, and I guess that's how I'd put 
the big picture advice. I think that's great. Um, and it sounds like if I can summarize that, that learning how to say no <laughs> to opportunities, right? And yeah, I'll yeah. use <laughs> parentheses for that is, or quotation marks. Um, sometimes the opportunity that you think is there maybe isn't the one that you should be taking and learning how to say no. That's actually, I feel yeah. like a lesson that I'm learning right now is that there are just things that I, I have to say no to in order to keep the most important things, the most important things. Yeah. Um, so for example, I'm just going to say that one of the things I sort of sacrificed is I had been starting to fly, um, before having kids. Um, and once I had, as I was having kids, I stopped flying. I had a hiatus for like 23 years until oh, wow. the kids were away old. And I mean, I had no time to do that and didn't really understand how pilots managed to have career family and flying in their lives. Um, and for me, if I was going to fly, I wanted it to be frequent, just risk management and all that, just keep up skills yeah. and proficiency. So I figure if I'm not able to do it, you know, frequently, I'm not going to do it. And I basically retired from flying after about three years and then came back to it way later. Yeah. You know, 20 how plus did, years. How did it feel to come back to it? Oh, it was a kick. <laughs> I really um, hadn't so planned it, but when my youngest son was a senior in high school, I started thinking, oh, I could do this again. You know, not that needed in the house anymore. Um, so <laughs> I decided I just would go up with an instructor and see what it was like. Um, do I really want to do this again? And I did. And i got to tell you, the first moments in the cockpit, sitting in the left seat, I was like instantly overwhelmed, like, oh, my gosh, you know, I forget, <laughs> you know, or what, 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 you know, like, there's a lot to keep track of here. And within, I don't know, minutes, I mean, within 10 minutes of beginning to fly, it was like, oh, yeah, never mind. This is like riding a bicycle. I can do, you know, I know how to do this. And it felt great. And so after um, just a couple hours, you know, like three hours of instruction where he took me up and through all the things you would do for a kind of quick currency training, um, I had my second opportunity to solo. <laughs> that was so fun to just solo and realize, yeah, I can do this. I'm going to do this again. And that got me going. So it was really fun. There in that 20 year period though, you know, 9-11 had happened, aerospace rules changed. There was hmm. a number of changes to learn about and, you know, lingo had changed and even the airplanes and the equipment had changed somewhat. So um, I thought that was fun to learn about and be part of, but um, that was part of that re-engage in flying experience, definitely. I'd love to quickly hear about highlights of flying. Um, what did you love about it? What did it do for you? I can share for me that flying is most one of the most uh, interesting experiences because it's not simultaneously, but at different times, the most relaxing and the mo can be the most stressful experience. Uh, we're both instrument rated. And so, you know, as I am cruising in between Phoenix and San Diego, where I work, a lot of that flight is pretty routine and autopilot does most of the flying and it's a great time for me to journal and just enjoy the scenery. And then you have an instrument approach into busy San Diego airspace or Los Angeles airspace uh, with clouds, you know, down to 700 feet or something. And then it's not so relaxing. There's a different level of focus. And uh, people that have flown with me have said, yeah, your whole demeanor changes when, <laughs> when it gets serious. I'm like, yeah, that's because it's serious. So I would love yeah. to know for you what some of those opposites have been. What are some of the fantastic moments that you've enjoyed? And then 
have there been the opposite of that also where maybe it was a little concerning the heart rate got up yeah yeah I, yes i've had all of the above and i've had that exhilaration of being in flight being in the sky you know being part of nature even though you're in a very mechanical <laughs> instrument it still feels like you're part of nature you're experiencing the feel of the air and um, the dynamics of the air and you're kind of one with the plane weaving through it um, the exhilaration of the just stunning beauty I've had a chance to see you know flying between layers of clouds at sunset and things that just mm -hmm. uh, you know take your breath away um, experience of flying from west to east coast and you know seeing the terrain just drop from you know the rockies and sharp peaks to um all of a sudden just flat green beautiful you know geometric shaped farmland and so forth and etc anyway exhilaration is you know definitely there i've also had the boring times honestly like flying across I don't know, example, the state of Texas, where, I mean, it's brown, <laughs> endless brown. There's not much to look at. I love looking at stuff on the ground and understanding where I am. And, you know, um, there are places that, you know, you spend hours just thinking, wow. Um, so, yeah, I've experienced those ups and somewhat downs, but um, I don't know. I've loved it. I think some of the challenges I've had are definitely way, way overshadowed by the fun and satisfaction and just personal development I've been able to experience with flying. So I've had challenges of, you know, being caught in a mountain wave over the Rockies. And I've had a couple of near misses that oh my God, weren't really so terrifying right in the moment, but right after the moment, right after. it was like, <laughs> oh my, what just happened there? Oh, you know, could I have done something differently? Oh, you know, I could have died, you know, with along with somebody else. Um, you know, I've had equipment failures here and there. I've been in tricky weather situations with, um, you know, IMC over mountainous terrain or icing um, that uh, was kind of scary. Um, so those are the things that are not so fun. I agree that some of the things that are challenging are awesome fun, even though they really have you figuratively on the edge of your seat. Um, and sometimes like literally on the edge of your yeah, seat. <laughs> and sometimes bumping your head on the ceiling at the same time, you know. But, um, you know, you know, I've just found that flying an instrument approach, as you mentioned, where you're literally in the soup and just that breaking out and seeing the runway right there lined up in front of you is so fun. Um, seeing... <laughs> you know, coming into Portland and seeing the rabbit lights just ushering you in and, you know, you, you break out and all of a sudden, oh my gosh, there's the rabbit lights, the arrows, just telling me what to do. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Um, lots of fun places I've flown that I just have this huge library in my mind of memories and, um, you know, great airports with fun runways or weird environments and cultures or <laughs> I don't know. So there's been a lot that has been, as you say, interesting. I would underscore interesting, but also, um, yes, in some ways being a pilot in command is a metaphor for one's life and how you might see yourself and, you know, 
you got to step up <laughs> and be in command um, while working with, um, you know, the resources you've got. And so, you know, well, the life lessons with flying. And I did come to see in myself something I didn't really realize and appreciate, but that when I'm in a highly stressed situation in the cockpit, um, I just develop a great instant solitary focus and seem to make good decisions and manage things just, you know, my, my training comes back to me or, or something. I just get through it um, well. And that, I think, translates to other things in my life. And to know that about myself, I don't know that I would have learned that any other way, or at least not so emotionally, you know, to yeah. learn that that's the case, where I've been in difficult spots and had to make quick decisions or, you know, challenging things that I would not have anticipated I could manage in the way I did. I don't get distracted. I don't, you know, just the world goes silent except for what I'm focused on doing. And maybe that's partly what you were saying too. Works for you. I, th I don't think yeah. it's true for everybody, but it's one of the things you test yourself as with a pilot, you know, as a pilot. Um, and I did recurrent training regularly with the airplane the, the sort of type club that I was part of, the Columbia group. And it's excellent recurrent training that had ground school and flying experience um, with a great instructors. And they really pushed the envelope. They really, you know, pushed mm -hmm. you almost past the point of your capability to uh, do a lot at once, simulating emergencies and, you know, flying approaches and missed approaches and doing things with instruments failing and all kinds of stuff. And um, that too was a great experience for me. It's about pushing yourself, learning where are your limits, knowing you do have limits and, you know, yet they are fewer than you may have thought going into it. Um, oh, I love that. So. But how do you give that up? Oh, that was hard. <laughs> it was the right decision, <laughs> the right time. But um, I, I will admit, it's a hard thing to do because we say it kind of gets in your blood. Um, so there were, you know, many times in the first year. It's been now two years. Um, I'd look in the sky and I just want to be there. Um, or, you know, I would um, hear about um, compelling angel flight story and I just want to do that again. Um, yeah. Or I would be wanting, needing to travel somewhere and I'd then, I'd go, oh, right. I can't fly myself, darn. <laughs> and it almost hurt <laughs> um, to have all those little experience, those losses. Um, so I think it's a hard transition to make. Um, for me, it worked to have those, acknowledge those feelings, but then really quickly turn it into you know, amazing appreciation and gratitude that I had these experience, awesome experience in my life, all these flight experiences um, that are so unique and um, so special to me. So, you know, you just have to flip the sense of loss to a sense of gratitude <laughs> and that work. But I did wish at the time there was something like a a support group for retiring pilots <laughs> that I could be with. And I, I did talk to some people who had retired, some retired pilots I knew and so forth, but it, it's a hard thing to give up. Um, 
I think I understand why some people hang on for years and years yeah. and maybe longer than they should. Maybe too long sometimes. Yeah. yeah. I dread that day. You know, yeah. I, yeah. Um, I, I think that's a little ways away for me, but uh, like you there, it becomes part of the fabric of who you are. Yeah. And at least for me is um, so intertwined with, my work, with my family, yeah. with friendships, um, with some value that I feel like I can add to the world, especially with being able to volunteer as, as a pilot and, and lead the Arizona wing for Angel yeah. Flight West. You know, that has, that is a core part of yeah. what I love doing. Um, and I know we're bumping up against the time that we allotted for this conversation, but I would love to hear, you know, maybe an impactful experience that you had uh, in your time volunteering for Angel Flight West. Um, and then, you know, right at the end of that, I, I told you that, you know, my dad said, remember the little things. I would love to hear if there's one or two little things, life lessons, lessons from aviation that uh, you feel like have made a big difference in your life um, to wrap things up. I would love to know that. Wow. That's a lot. So um, what was the first question? You had a first question. Yeah. Uh, significant experiences with Angel, oh, Flight, with Angel West. Flight Yes. Um, I've had so many significant experiences with Angel Flight West, uh, flying passengers. Um, I been inspired a lot by my passengers um people going through life-threatening challenges or difficulties medically and um you know i we, you get to talk to them in the cockpit for sure and seeing their level of acceptance and their continued engagement in life um, yeah. in the face of that. So that's been inspiring with patients of all kinds of stripes and so forth. Um, one the impactful experience was that I flew a domestic violence um, survivor from um California to, well, I, I flew the first of three legs, you know, she had to get out of Dodge with her two year old daughter. Um, mm -hmm. She had gotten into a shelter temporarily, but her abuser was hanging around on threatening. And so we made the arrangement and, you know, kept it very private um such that if she was being followed that wasn't gonna threaten us in our uh departure and but it was very moving because she had um cognition issues from brain damage from uh, the abuse that she suffered her two-year-old had some issues as well and I guess the impact was simply, wow, this is completely changing this young woman's life. And good for her, how brave, to leave everything behind and move to an entirely, you know, across two states um, to start a new life. Um, so I you know, just appreciate what people go through that you don't even realize when you walk around <laughs> every day and you know yeah. ask people everyone has stories as you know and we've seen in angel flight some of the stories that are you know big challenges for people i don't know that's one example of so many so many yeah so many yeah and you know the little things or i think i really appreciate your dad's slogan there, because I have come to very much feel that the little things make a big difference. Um, 
just in my own experience and in my professional career, as well as my just interpersonal dealings, whether it's Angel Flight West passengers or, you know, people I come across in, in other ways, I feel, you know, very clear that we all have influence in the world that we don't see. And it's, you know, the ripple effects. It's, you know, being a kind, generous person and living that way, you know, people say things way later to me occasionally about something that, you know, made a big difference in their life and now they're following suit or, um, and, and many times during my professional career, you know, I'll bump into somebody 10 years later at a conference or something and they'll say, you know, I always remember this thing you said about, and it's like, really? Oh my gosh, that's deeply moving and satisfying to me. And it makes me realize that, yeah, we have um, big ripple effects from our behavior that influence others and in turn then influence others. And that's the power we have in the world. Um, and I remind myself of that when I feel overwhelmed about world events and things I have absolutely no control over. Um, where do I have my power? And it's very local. It's in my everyday actions. And um, so that is maybe qualifies as a little thing <laughs> that has been an important understanding that I've come to and that gives me motivation to, you know, be a good person so that it's like role modeling for others around me and especially very young people. And, um, you know, when in doubt, be generous. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, it's very rewarding actually and, uh, comforting. But I appreciate your wisdom and experience. Uh, I'm looking forward to follow up conversation at a coffee shop or something in Portland. Yeah. This was so fun for me. And, you know, you can add me to the list of people that at some point is going to say, hey, thank you for that conversation. It oh. made a difference. Um, this has been marvelous. Uh, thank you for sharing your professional experience, your piloting experience and and the wisdom that you've gained over a wonderful life. I'm excited to see what this new chapter in life brings to you and relationships and friendships and pottery and all of the wonderful <laughs> things that you're experiencing now. Thank you for joining me on the Plain Success Podcast. Thanks, Alan. It's been a pleasure and I look forward to more conversations as well. And I just wanna say, when you do face retiring from flying, Call me. <laughs> okay. I can be a support buddy. I will. We'll put together the support group. <laughs>